Hello, my name is Gerald Friedland, and I teach data science at UC Berkeley. A frequent question that I get from people is, what is generalization? Generalization is an interesting concept that is connected to learning in general, and specifically also to machine learning. It's helpful for practitioners to understand how generalization works. So I'm giving this lecture in the hope that it's useful. Let's look at real life first. You typically come across generalization when you study for an exam. Let's assume it's an oral exam. The professor asks you a question. You fire back with a verbatim textbook answer. The immediate question the professor then asks himself or herself is, OK, is that answer memorized from the textbook? Or is it actually understood? This difference between memorization and understanding is what we call generalization. Let's look at some math. If I give you this number sequence, 6, 5, 1, 4, and I ask you, can you predict what is the next number? Well, I will save you some time uh, trying because I chose an example to make it impossible. But let me give you another sequence for comparison. 2, 4, 6, 8. Now if I ask you what the next number in that sequence is, you will probably guess 10. Why? Because you can immediately see from the sequence that there's a rule there, plus 2. As a result, all you have to do is to memorize the rule, plus 2. And then even if I give you an unseen number like, let's say, 1 million, you can predict the next number in the sequence correctly, 1 million and 2. So now, with memorizing only that rule, you can predict any number even if you haven't seen the number before. In fact, you can even forget which numbers led you to generalize the rule. You have the rule now. Who cares what the initial numbers were, right? However, in the case of 6, 5, 1, 4, you will have to memorize the verbatim sequence without being able to generalize to unseen numbers. A very important consequence of this example is that the common mantra of there is no data like more data is incorrect. There is no data like more data would mean that I could say 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and so on and so forth, and 18, and 20, and 22, and you will benefit from that. However, the truth is you're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't waste my time going through all the numbers. I already know the rule. So in general, I would phrase it as, there's no data like having enough data so that you can infer the rule. Now, how does this help in practical data science? Let's take a look at what we actually do in data science. So we call these numbers that you see here, 2, 4, 6, 8, or 6, 5, 1, 4, a sequence of observations. In general, when we deal with data, we deal with observations. These observations are the number of clicks on a certain product in the present, then you could try to use this data to predict how many units will be sold in the future. We can formalize all recorded observations as a table. A table will look like this. You have x1 to xm. These are the components of the observations. For example, it could be pixel values of an image or the configuration of a chemical experiment. Let us remember that everything you ever store on a computer is binary. So a cat image is just a sequence of binary digits. And what you may want out of it, for example, from a classifier, is whether this set of pixels in binary form is a cat or a dog. In fact, for now, we will focus on classification. So you take all these binary digits in, and you want the classifier to tell you cat or dog. First, you train the classifier with examples, and then later on, the classifier is hopefully able to take in a sequence, in fact, any sequence, of binary encoded cat and dog images and make it a correct decision. Obviously, it depends on the classifier learning the correct rule. So now, for training, you most likely will not succeed with giving it just one cat image or one dog image. You have to give it a lot more data. So just like 2, 4 wouldn't give you enough information to confidently infer plus 2. It could be times 2, for example. In machine learning, we call each row of the table an instance. If you wanted to talk geometry, we would call each row a point. They're just super high dimensional. Now, for the sake of this lecture, we will only look at binary classifiers because it just makes things easier. That means your f of x is either 0 or 1, cat or dog, 
yes or no. Okay, we're data scientists. We are given this table and we restricted ourselves to binary data. Now what will we do with this? Well, you'll say, well, now we try all the tricks and we try to see, you know, if we can do deep learning, or if we can do a random forest, or if we can try support vector machines, whatever is in fashion right now. That's great, but I want to keep it in a higher level and discuss what happens at a higher level. In general, what we're doing is we're trying to convert the table that we're given into a black box. It's going to be just a box like this. And of course, black box is a technical term. And what it means is that we don't really know what we're doing. We're training something up. But the question is, can we say something about the black box, especially with regards to its ability to generalize? And the answer is, yeah. Let's take a look. The first conclusion we can draw is that we're required to measure accuracy. This is usually done by dividing the correctly predicted instances by the total number of instances. This makes the black box a finite state machine, as neither enumerator nor denominator can be infinite. Finite state machines, also sometimes called finite state automatons, are basically things that have a starting state, then you have some input, and based on the input, you go to another state, and then maybe you have another input, and you go to another state. In the end, you have a stopping state. Now, if you think about this in general, for the problem that we have in front of us, what would be the simplest finite state machine we could build to achieve 100% accuracy in training? We get 100% accuracy if we are able to at least get back the original data from the table. In other words, what we call memorizing will give us 100% accuracy in training. If you are given the sequence 6514, what would you have to do to model it as a state machine? The simplest machine would be the finite state machine that is a starting state somewhere, and then takes the input x1, xm, x2, xm in, and ends up in a stopping state. For the cat and dog classifier, you have an arrow with each input, and would then end up in a stopping state of cat or dog. That's basically the trick. The input we are giving it, this is the x1 to xm, and then we do this. Now, we can ask ourselves in the trivial case of memorization, how many state transitions would we need? That's actually pretty simple to see because what we need is we start here and we say 1, 2, and then we end up with exactly n. So if we memorize the table, we would take all the n inputs and all the n outputs and we would just say if it's exactly this input, we get exactly this output. Now that's interesting because what this means is that we have a perfect memorizer. In essence, we just translated the lookup table into something more complicated. Why do I say more complicated? Because yes, we can train a deep residual neural network to just be a lookup table. As a consequence, everything unseen will lead to random predictions. How would we know that we have something more intelligent than a lookup table? This is that we're actually generalizing. Well, let's look at the initial example. We know we are generalizing if we don't have to save the input. This means we don't have to have as many state transitions as we would need in a table. We only need enough state transitions to memorize the rule. That right there actually gives us a generalization measure. Let me explain. Let's assume we're given uniform random input points as input and uniformly random outputs. Based on the definition of uniformly random, we are unable to deduce any rule. So in this case, then we would obviously need n state transitions, as all we can do is memorize. The number of correctly classified points, however, would then be exactly the number of points in our training data. As a consequence, if we are able to find a rule, it means that the number of correctly classified points must actually be higher than n. This means we can perform more classifications correctly than we have state transitions in our system. So let's just measure that. The number of correctly classified points, or we can also call this correctly predicted instances, divided by the number of instances that could be memorized. How many instances could be memorized depends on the concrete measure learner that we're actually using. But what we want for generalization is that g is much greater than 1. And we're actually generalizing because we're better than memory. So if g is smaller or equal to 1, this is usually called 
overfitting. As explained earlier, we are memorizing. We could be lucky and do better, but we can't really rely on this. For example, we may measure high accuracy on a test set, indicating we are better than a lookup table, but the problem is we can usually not guarantee the independence of the test set. So it's risky to rely on models that have a generalization ratio that is smaller than one. So the question now is the denominator. What is the number of random instances that can be memorized by a concrete machine learner? Well, that really depends on what I call the memory equivalent capacity of the machine learner. We measure memorization in bits. Given that we have a whole theory, information theory, that will tell you how many bits are required to memorize something, it's useful to use bits. So in conclusion, generalization is the number of correctly classified instances divided by the memory equivalent capacity. For a binary classifier, the memory equivalent capacity gives us the number of instances that can be guaranteed to be learned and classified correctly, even if they were uniform random. Let me quickly explain the connection with memory. If you have memory of n bits, you can exactly store all the 2 to the power of n configurations. With n bits of plain memory, you can get n bits correctly memorized, even if the sequence is uniformly random. So now how does this help us design machine learners as a data scientist? Let's work with a concrete machine learner, and here's one that actually lends itself well to this kind of analysis, a neuron. Also, neural networks in general have been investigated a lot, and one work that saw neurons as memory is the work of David McKay. His 2003 book has one chapter on the capacity of the perceptron. And what's interesting there is that the memory capacity of a perceptron in bits is exactly the number of its parameters. So let's take a quick look at how this works. Let's assume we have a single perceptron. The single perceptron has two inputs, and let's make them binary just for fun, and we have these two weights and a bias. And obviously, a perceptron just implements this function where you ask if a dot product is greater than a threshold. If so, the neuron fires. Otherwise, it's zero. Let's test this. It means this perception with three parameters, two weights and one bias, should have three bits of memory equivalent capacity. Or, since it's a binary classifier, it is able to guarantee the labeling of three instances. Now let's compare this to the works of Marvin Minsky. Minsky was actually quite upset about the fact that the single perceptron cannot be trained to all Boolean functions of two variables. Okay, let's take a quick look at it with our framework. Using the table framework, we see that if you have functions of two Boolean variables, it will look like this. x1 and x2, and let me do the computer scientist thing, which is to draw our configurations. Four state of the two variables, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And then you have f of x. Now we have 16 possible f, which is the result of 2 to the power of 4 possible configurations of 4 result bits. Now, of the 16 possible functions, Minsky found that only 14 could be implemented, and the two that don't work are xor and not xor. Let's get an intuition for why these two don't work. Just for fun, we'll do one that works first, and. As you know, and is true only if both variables are true, and in every other state it's zero. So why, with a memory equivalent capacity of three bits, can we actually predict our binary instances correctly? If we can't, it seems like one, two, three, we can memorize four states. Well, that can't work. It can't be by memorization. It has to be by generalization. But why can we generalize four state transitions from the input to the output when in reality we just showed that we can do only three? Well, that's not right. No, it actually is, because that's the power of generalization. This is the power of machine learning. If you take a look at how at the end function works, we will see that the state of variable x2 doesn't matter when x1 is already zero. In other words, if x1 is zero, we can do what is called lazy evaluation and really forget about what x2 is. Now, if we strike these two values out, we can see, oh, wait a minute, there's another redundancy, which is this row is duplicated. And see what's going on. We can reduce the table 
to three output values or in total three state transitions. This is the reason why we can actually train a perceptron to learn AND even with only three bits of memory equivalent capacity. So the generalization is G equals four correctly classified points divided by three memorizable points. Now, why does XOR not work? Well, we should look at XOR then. XOR is one if the two values are different. So XOR would be zero here, zero here, and one here. Now you can try as much as you want, and trust me, I have. You don't find any redundancy. The intuition for this comes from not XOR, which is the inverse of XOR and looks like this. One, zero, zero, one. But if you take a close look of what not XOR actually is, you'll find out that not XOR is actually equality. Yes, this function returns true if and only if the two variables have the same value. You can easily show by induction that equality can only be decided by actually looking at all states. And that makes intuitive sense. Two memory regions are equal if and only if all bits are equal. If only one random bit is not equal, then they're not equal. <laughs> and that means you have to go through the entire memory. There's no way to generalize equality. That's why XOR and not XOR are not representable with the three bits of capacity provided by one perceptron. So obviously, you can use multiple neurons, and with that higher memory equivalent capacity, you can now memorize XOR or not XOR without generalization. So now, how can we actually find the memory equivalent capacity of a neural network? There are four rules on how you can find out what the memory equivalent capacity of a neural network is. There's a paper on the internet, and we'll put a link down, um, as I don't have the time to explain how these four rules are derived. Rule number one is, the output of a neuron is maximally one bit. That's intuitive, while it fires or it doesn't fire, right? We have this inequality here with the dot product, and it's either greater than or not greater than the threshold. And it's obviously maximally one bit. It's one bit if and only if the two output states are equiprobable, which never happens. <laughs> so this means it's actually maximally one bit. Number two is, and I said this before, the number of parameters is the memory equivalent capacity in bits. Again, I refer to McKay there. Number three is more interesting. What happens if you put two neurons in parallel? If you do this, like you take a neuron and you take another neuron that connects to the same input and they have this output, you can show, and we do this in the paper, that the memory equivalent capacity of two neurons in parallel is additive because you can always find an output layer neuron that selects the right line. It is intuitive because we know that the two memory cells have twice the storage of one memory cell. What happens if you put layers of parallel neurons in series? This is called deep learning, and the way to think about this is this. The output of a single neuron actually is maximally one bit, and of n parallel neurons is maximally n bit. Now there's something called the data processing inequality. It says that you cannot create information by processing. The way to see this is if you have n bits coming out of a layer, the next layer can only work with those n bits. This is, all you can ever observe is 2 to the power of n states coming out there. The next layer cannot create new states by further thresholding those 2 power of n states. When you're thresholding, you're setting states to 0, or you can keep them, but you cannot create new ones. So in other words, rule number 4 is that the memory equivalent capacity of a layer of neurons is restricted by its input. So that means we now have four rules that we can just apply to pretty much any neural network and figure out what its memory equivalent capacity is. Let me give you an example here. We already know the single perceptron has three bits of capacity. Now, we actually add two in parallel, and then why don't we just also do the typical thing where we do deep layering? And then we connect them this way. And obviously, in the end, we need an output neuron. So now you will see that this is 1, 2, 3, plus 3, maximally 6 bits. So the first layer has 6 bits of capacity. The output of these two neurons, however, is only 2 bits. It doesn't matter that we multiplex those 2 bits into 4 connections. The same bit is coming out of the 2 each. So that means that while individually the second layer has maximally 6 bits of capacity as well, because it has 1, 2, 3 parameters, each as of rule 3, Rule 4 limits the capacity to 2 bits. 
So we need to say 6 plus 2. And then the last one is the same thing. We have two output bits instead of three, so we have maximally two bits as well. And so now that gives you a total maximally 10 bits of memory equivalent capacity. Now, what do you do with those 10 bits? If you have a binary classification task of 10 instances, you know it's guaranteed to work. The only thing that prevents you from having 100% accuracy is the training procedure could end up in the local minimum. Moreover, these 10 bits can be memorized. That means you're setting yourself up for overfitting. But let's say you can use this network to predict 20 instances. Then, congratulations, you generalize 2 to 1. Now you might say, well, a generalization 2 to 1 sounds like a compression of 2 to 1. And in fact, that's exactly what it is. Machine learning is relevance compression. We know relevance compression from our TVs and MP3 players. An MP3 player compresses all audio bits away that are supposedly not relevant for acoustic perception. In JPEG, the bits of information that don't help with perceiving the images are eliminated. In machine learning, we cut the information away that doesn't help us with a decision. For example, whether an image shows a cat or a dog. So generalization is compression. The more inputs a single state transition of the finite state machine can handle at the same time, the more we are generalizing. So we can now change our machine learning process to aim for generalization instead of memorization accuracy. I recommend to size our machine learner black box such that we start at memory equivalent capacity equals the number of instances in the training data. This should get us to 100% accuracy on the training set if we're training right. If we don't get to 100% accuracy, then probably our training has some issues or we're regularizing implicitly. So now that we get to 100-ish percent, the next thing we do is reducing memory equivalent capacity and then train again. Repeat this process until training accuracy goes down too much. The accuracy on a test set should improve and then we go down as we progress with a capacity reduction. Doing that, we try to force the machine learner to find a rule rather than memorizing the input. The goal is to find the best generalization and accuracy trade-off. We can also repeat the process with a different machine learner to see which one has the best generalization accuracy trade-off. What is interesting to note is that we only count correctly classified instances. We don't need any assumption of independence between test and training set because independence is hard to guarantee. Furthermore, we can keep the process that we have in place but all we do is we really make sure that each instance we train and test on is distinct. In the end, we count the correctly classified instances and divide them by the memory equivalent capacity, and we have G. If you want to know more about memory equivalent capacity, please take a look at the papers we linked down there. And also, we have a little demonstration app called TF Meter. It uses TensorFlow to visualize where you can experiment with your own neural network to see how generalization and memory equivalent capacity work together. Thank you very much for listening.